A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their influences, including literature, music, film and of course art, and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's a brush with Nari Ward, an artist who often uses found materials from baby strollers to baseball bats and shoelaces. He repurposes them in sculptures, wall-based text works and installations that address present and historical social and political issues, including race and poverty, and deal directly with human emotions like loss and hope. In his approach both to material and content, Nari deals with the big questions, with heaven and earth. The late curator Okwayan Wazor said of him that he had completely transformed the scale and the ambition of installation art. Nari was born in 1963 in St Andrew, Jamaica, and moved with his family to the US when he was 12. He now lives and works in New York, and specifically Harlem, which has been much more than the location of his home and studio, often providing the raw materials and the thematic basis of his art. Now he studied at Hunter College and Brooklyn College. He's a professor of art at Hunter College today. After graduating from his MFA at Brooklyn, he gained a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 1993. And while on the residency, he made Amazing Grace in response to a number of crises at the time, including the AIDS and crack epidemics and related social problems. Now he found more than 300 discarded baby strollers in Harlem, the kind often used by the homeless population there to hold their possessions. He bound them with twisted fire hoses and arranged them in a shape that's been seen as resembling the form of a ship and regarded as a comment on the history of slavery. The installation was gloomily lit and accompanied by a looped recording of Mahalia Jackson singing Amazing Grace. Like many of his early works, it was both created and shown in a disused fire station in Harlem that he first rented and eventually bought. It remains his studio today. Since then, he's created numerous similarly impactful installations. Peacekeeper features a bashed-up hearse covered in tar and peacock feathers and set in a cage with exhaust pipes or mufflers both below the car and hanging above. The work was first shown in the Whitney Biennial in 1995 and was recreated for Grief and Grievance, Ockwee and Wazel's posthumous show at the New Museum, also in New York, in 2021. Another piece Nary made for the 1995 Biennial was Iron Heavens, in which a number of baseball bats were charred and covered in tropical-flavoured fizzy drinks and cotton and leant against a wall beneath overlapping oven pans. Nary saw the pans as a kind of firmament, the drilled holes in them like constellations of stars. Both those works for the biennial, rich in metaphor and associations, have a pronounced spiritual power and melancholy alongside their undoubtedly spectacular sculptural forms. Among Nari's best-known works are text pieces made from sneaker laces, arranged to form the outlines of phrases borrowed from various sources, which can provoke all manner of responses in the viewer. We the people is the opening phrase of the preamble to the US Constitution, and just those words, emblazoned in multiple colours on a wall, are pregnant with ambiguity and potential meaning. Who exactly are the people? What role do they play in defining how they're governed? Other texts include snatches of song lyrics or lines from poems, as we'll hear. They're always laden with meaning, often notions of resistance, resilience and transcendence. And spirituality, cosmologies and belief systems have been a constant presence in Nari's work. A rich seam in his practice opened up when he visited a church in Savannah, Georgia in the US, which you'll hear him describe in our conversation. There he found a Congolese cosmogram, a symbol of evoking the life cycle formed from holes in the church floor. That symbol connected to the underground Railroad, the route taken by enslaved people fleeing to northern states and Canada. It's appeared in numerous works by Nari, including the breathing panels, apparently abstract copper sheets which bear the imprint of Nari's shoes after he'd applied darkening patina to them. Just one of the ways in which he brings his own bodily presence to historical and cultural narratives. The cosmograms also appear in a series of sculptures using grandfather clocks called Anchoring Escapement, which also include sculptures made by Fang peoples in Gabon and Cameroon. Nari brings together forms and languages that draw in multiple identities within the African diaspora, from Africa itself to the Caribbean and African-American cultures. 
And one of the quintessential forms of African-American material culture is the quilt. Much of Nari's work involves forms of weaving or embroidery, and objects are often entwined in the fabric of the piece, whether that's in the use of fire hoses in Amazing Grace or rope and string in another of his best-known and constantly evolving installations, Hunger Cradle from 1996, in which everything from piano keys to a tyre and a computer keyboard are caught in a sprawling, woven web. And it's this with which I began our conversation. Is Nari fundamentally a quilter with that long history of textile art at the base of his practice? I think a lot of me working with materials is really trying to find different ways for those materials to uh, come together in a space where the boundaries collapse. Also the boundaries of kind of knowing what the thing is. Generally, my strategy has really been to start out with something readily recognizable, a found object, and then trying to take that thing into a space of mystery. And what I found that was work for me is using other elements, incorporating into the form in a way that somehow changes the expectation for what that thing is, right? So so that, that sort of hybridizing on a material level also changes the, the expectation for what world it even fits into. Yeah, and the late curator Okui and Wazor linked that directly in your work to this idea of creolization or creolite, and that directly connects to the Caribbean. And you were born in Jamaica and then came to the States. Do you still see a lot of the Caribbean in your work today? I agree with that. But Okui also said that the, the sort of European mind is kind of claimed this fictional notion of originality. You know, there's no original <laughs> anything. And if that is a fact, and I think it is, that everything is creolized. Everything is, is a combination of something, depending on when we experience it, to know that. So I do feel like that's something I'm really aware of, is that this notion of purity is a real strange expectation that I, th- I think is an imaginary space that produces different kinds of conclusions. For me, not keeping that as a, a mainstay or as a kind of high ground and putting it in its right place, which is that everything is evolving, which is what the creolization, the premise of it is, kind of makes it all make sense. And you don't create these fictional uh, narratives of one thing being better or more sought after than the other. That's a really interesting idea that there's a sort of democracy of materials in your work. You don't fix the meaning of each individual element to such an extent that they become immovable in your own sort of working through them, right? Yeah, you know, the idea of them being discards, supposedly discards, is a challenge that I'm taking on for them in that now they're, in that respect, they're new for me, new in a sense that there's room for them to occupy different spaces, and that idea of occupying different spaces is kind of the what I want from the viewer to take on that journey, to go to this other space um, and have the word take them there. So, yeah, that's exactly the way I, I think about it. Tell me about the role of metaphor, because it's, it's really interesting because it seems to me that there are some works where the materials absolutely play a kind of metaphorical role and others where you're sort of teasing them into that space, in effect, allowing the audience to decide on their metaphorical power or, or value. And metaphors are kind of the through line in a lot of the work because it really is trying to have something stand in for something else. But at the same time, I'm also critical of that because metaphor is also based on a sort of pre-conclusion. So I, I'm also trying to confuse the expectation for the metaphor. So there is this idea that there is a journey into the metaphor, but I don't want it to be the end point, the destination. And I think some poetry does this really well, is that you sort of leave the gap for people to, uh, even within the metaphor, for other conclusions to be navigated, you know? And and I think that is also empowering. As much as a lot of viewers don't feel empowered, they feel confused sometimes and feel that they're being tricked into a, a kind of space that's hard for them to navigate. I think it's an exercise that's important because I do feel like that, space in between ideas and and meaning and even motions is really furtive, really important. Is it therefore a sort of tricky balance in terms of how you employ opacity and 
directness is there always that interplay between the kind of different modes of the language if you like oh definitely yeah and i think being an artist you know the the whole idea is you're navigating in the space of the artifice the side buggy to reality right and it's never about that being the real thing it's always in some adjacency and and in fact it's never driving right the side buggy is always next to the bike but it's important because it really gives you a different view of where life is going, where that vehicle, where that expectation is. And I, and I think that for me is is really important space for, for trying to get the viewer to occupy it. And I know it, it creates anxiety and it's, it sometimes is difficult, but I really feel like it can be strangely enough empowering because you kind of know your relationship to, to the momentum of, again, using that metaphor of the side vehicle to the motorcycle, you sort of know the, the landscape in a different way. And I wanted to ask you also about puns and wordplay and, and, and the way that in the language it's bound up with the material. So in Peacekeeper, you've got tar and feathers and in Spellbound, you've got a piano and keys. So there's this sort of interesting wordplay that it feels to me like the words are, are a material alongside the physical materials as well. Yeah, Ben. And it's, in fact, it's, it's kind of a big part of the work, finding the right naming for the ideas around the journey of the work. Even while I'm working on the piece, I won't even know that it's done until I kind of figure out what the title might be. You know? And sometimes it's interesting, sometimes a title for an idea comes first, and then that sometimes guides some of the decisions that I make. So the naming is, is really important because it really sets up the atmosphere for these ideas to be placed. I like that sometimes a word might cancel itself out. You know, like when I chose to use the We the People text, for instance, for the shoelace works, which is one of those sort of, you know, me bringing in the word into the conversation of life and material. It was really about using a word or a series of words that people don't really inquire about because they sort of see it as almost like this symbolic gesture that you can't take apart. And I really wanted to sort of break down that phrase and slow it down for the viewer to sort of think about and navigate it in a different way. That's great. I wanted to ask also about the process of gathering because you began for instance, with Amazing Grace, you, you gathered every single one of those strollers actually on the street, right? And it was pre-eBay, so there was no way to do that <laughs> otherwise, I guess. But but obviously now there is eBay, and I've read that you've said that the way that objects are deposited on the streets have changed. So I wonder how that's altered your process, your actual m- making process. Do you feel it has, or is it just a, a different route to getting the materials that you want? Oh, no, no, it's, it's altered. But I am sometimes nostalgic to defined. And I do, you know, like to just walk the streets with that in mind that something is going to find me. But there are moments, like you said in eBay, and it, you're right, it's really shifted everything. It's made it more efficient. And it's it's a little bit like the library versus Wikipedia or something, right? Like I, I had this big conversation and not necessarily argument, maybe a yeah, a little bit of an argument with a younger artist. And they were saying how amazing it is to just Google your your research. And and I was saying, yeah, but I miss the physicality of the library. And, you know, you go and look for a book. And then next to that book is something that you didn't anticipate adventuring it. And he was like, oh, but that happens on eBay. It does, but it it's not by chance. The algorithm is not a chance, right? And so there's a, there's a different set of rules that are navigating what information you come across. And the element of chance is something that I, it is a material. For me, chance is a material. And, and it's a, and a material that dictates a lot in so many different ways that you, you can't leave it up to an algorithm to help facilitate. So I'm very suspect of it. I, I felt like an old man talking about, I remember when, <laughs> and I still like the idea of materials coming to me rather than me clicking and ordering them and having them delivered. Not to say that doesn't happen because there are moments where I have the idea in mind and it's really about fulfilling the space and needing the material to help me facilitate that transformation. And so I'll order it on eBay or any number of sites to get used objects, right? I mean, it was it was kind of the the one really 
it's funny stories, the, the fire hose, for instance, what I was working with early on, the fire department couldn't give the stuff away. The, the sanitation department was mumbling when they, you know, dropped it off. And when they found out I was, you know, an artist in Harlem interested in working with this material, they literally were delivering it to me, right? And that doesn't happen now because there's probably a number of websites that could get it out into the marketplace and get it sold to different industries. So it's a definite uh, change the whole field. And in, and in terms of the neighborhood, Harlem has changed so much and for good and bad. But the good part is that things have been much better maintained. So a lot of uh, objects that might be on the street won't stay there past the next garbage cycle, right? They, they'll be picked up. And, and in the past, it could be there for months. Unfortunately, that was the reality of Harlem in the, the 90s and early uh, 2000s. And of course, there's a whole new complexion on this whole story of finding things on the street in terms of your latest work right so you, during covid the streets changed tell us about how that's affected you yeah and it's a kind of a return to this chance dialogue combined with the determination and obsession with collecting what i noticed was when i got up early in the morning to do my walks and i, I walk quite a lot in the morning time before everybody gets up there would be literally hundreds of alcohol bottles out on the sidewalk and, you know, in, on these sort of random streets. And what it was is just because all the bars were closed during COVID and there was, uh, you know, people weren't supposed to be gathering inside. A lot of folks would come outside and just be on the street celebrating and, and drinking. And then you would see bottles and candles as memorials set up. And so there were both of these, one that was much more about the kind of celebration of gathering and, and a life. And then one was about a dedication of memorializing somebody who might've transitioned. And so there's something about that material, the, the empty liquor bottles, and also the, the candles, the glass candles, memorial candles, the prayer candles, they call them, that I really wanted to, to work with. And so I started collecting them. I started collecting them to, to tell the story because I felt like, for me, they were talking about something that I wanted to, to try to figure out how to, to work with them as a kind of instrument for my own storytelling. And how have you manipulated them? Have you taken them quite literally and, and almost used them as purely found objects? Or have you shifted them into somewhere different? Yeah, I wanted to find a way to sort of reinscribe them, right? Because that's a delicate thing when you're talking about memorials and you talk about specifically death I had to figure out how to shift the gaze with that being the kind of shadow that's going to be always part of the work. And so I just finished working on a body of these copper panels, these breathing panels is using copper material. And, and, I, and I was really taken by copper and excited about using copper as a material because of its, its connection to healing, its connection to resilience, this idea of, you know, never really breaks down. I, I guess I also was intrigued that it was connected to currency as well, right? The penny. Being that the penny is almost like this currency that's being propped up, you know, like it costs more to make the penny than it's actually worth. But it, all of these things are intriguing. You know, the, the healing component was also the, the, the main thing though. And I like that when this manner that I was using it, I was able to activate the light, bring light into the dialogue with the work by kind of playing the copper panel. So that became a kind of grounding for the candles. So what I did was I, I really wanted to bring the candles, this element of light, and the candles that were spent, it was what intrigued me. So I would go to these memorials and I would bring new candles and take the ones that were spent, the ones that were no longer could carry the flame where they had went out. And I would switch the new ones for the, the spent ones. And then I would bring the spent ones back to my studio. And that was really important. I didn't want to just buy new candles and, and go directly to my process. I really wanted the candle that was engaged for a purpose and engaged for an element of devotion and memory for that person who might have lit it. And then it was important for me and for the, for the work. And so I then used the spent candles to guide the sort of artifice of these works that I created from them that were called Peace Walk. So there were two bodies of work that I worked on recently from this investigation with the candles. They were Peace Walk and Arrested, R-E-S-T-I-N. And, and so both of them sort of were, were really trying to talk to this idea of light and light and the crossroads. The crossroads is an element that I had investigated in the earlier body of work, which are the breathing panels that had this symbolism, which is a Congolese cosmogram. 
And within this Congolese cosmic gram is a cross in a diamond. And it is this symbol for the, the group that I saw in a church in Savannah, Georgia. The church that was built by enslaved individuals, enslaved people. And they had it as a, as a sort of symbol on the grand floor. Like there were 26 or so of these symbols that were drilled into the floor. And come to the saying is that they were actually uh, breathing holes for the site, which is a site for the Underground Railroad. Now, nobody really knows that, right? I mean, that's what researchers uh, believe, which is uh, more intriguing for me that it's, you know, it, we'll never really know what if this is a real use or not. But anyway, I was intrigued by this idea of the crossroads because the symbol is also the sunrise and sunset, right? It's the it's a horizon line. It's it's like any cross. That's kind of what the symbol represents. And so I wanted to bring that into the, the sidewalk space. And so a lot of the work, the configuration, especially in the, in the Reston work, the configuration I made with the candles is the Congolese cosmogram. And then I patinaed the copper around these forms the candles themselves the glass and the evidence or the the kind of imprint they left became what i i kind of radiated what i started to scar into the copper to reilluminate so the breathing panels is really about the holes and the darkness of those holes and so i use these uh, copper nails to even make the holes seem that much darker so the copper nails kind of inundated around the holes and in this body of work the rest and in the peace walk I brought the nails back, but the, the nails were meant to be uh, a kind of reference to the candlelight and the, the different kind of radiance that I really wanted this body of work to have. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? Now, so, so Ben, this is a tough one because, you know, it doesn't mean that they're serious fine artists because, you know, it means that I was a young artist and I, I'm, I'm not defending myself because, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, Michelangelo, Leonardo, da Vinci, those are illustrators. They were brilliant illustrators because they were telling a story because my, my daughter is, she's looking to think about art. Maybe she's not going to be an artist, but she's much older. She's in her twenties, but she asked me a question the other day because I, I mentioned to her that I went to School of Visual Arts for illustration. And she, she, she said, you know, just somebody basically saying, what's the difference between what you are now than what, what's the illustrator? Because you're, you're doing pictures, you're telling stories. And the big difference is two differences, I, I told her. The one is the illustrator is told in a way what they should illustrate. They're doing a job for a task for an industry, which, whether it's the church or advertising industry. And the other one is they're not really interested in question asking. It's a stated fact. They're re-inscribing the thing that's known. Um, so I'm saying that because in the, my earlier iteration, I was really into these illustrators called Brothers Hildebrands. Uh -huh. And the Brothers Hildebrand, I think it was Tim and Greg Hildebrand, they illustrated one of the posters for The Lord of the Rings. And they also illustrated one of the posters for Star Wars. What was really great, though, is I got to meet them when I was in grade school. And so that changed a lot for me. My teacher at the time, my uh, grade school teacher knew them and he brought them in, or one of them, I think it was Tim, to collaborate with the class. This is pretty phenomenal, collaborate with the class on an album cover. And so they were phenomenal. I guess this the first sort of light of what an artist could do. But which historical artist do you turn to the most now? Now it's a lot, but one of my heroes, because of, his sort of critique of the kind of capitalist system that all of us artists are having to navigate on a daily career basis is Manzoni, Piero Manzoni. But a lot of his work had to do with critiquing this notion of value. The value that he critiqued is something that I'm always really intrigued with in terms of how artists are valued and what makes them valued in the culture. And of course, you made those smiles. And I was going to ask you about Manzoni because the canned smile, was that a direct Manzoni reference? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So his canned smiles, I mean, his, his shit cans <laughs> were really a starting point. But it was really about taking that pessimism and applying it to a different kind of framework. So my smiles were really about the minstrel smiles. The minstrel smile was 
was his defense, right? That was his way to survive in a sort of white supremacist space with all the complications. And it was almost, could even be seen as a you to everything, right? And so I kind of wanted a smile to be like a, a transgressive tool. And in that can smiles, it was about that. I also wanted to ask you about Mirandi, because I understand in your new show at Lehman Morpin that you've done a work called Still Life with Step Ladders, which is a direct reference to Mirandi. And that's not a reference that I'd have expected with your work at all. <laughs> so, okay, so this is gets me back to the sidewalk. It gets me back to waking up in the morning and just seeing all these bottles on the sidewalk, right? And, I, and, and, and they were still lives. And I was like, well, how do I bring the sidewalk, this space of randomness, the street and the sidewalk, into the sort of gallery space, which is the white cube, which is controlled environment. What I could do is bring them in with this camouflage of being a kind of conservative, mysterious invocation, right? Which is what I always thought Mirandi is. He's like this amazing artist. His persistence in trying to find something. I never thought that he was depicting bottles and cans. They were a tool for him to navigate some other kind of research. And he stripped it down to kind of most of the ones that I was really intrigued, the monochromatic nature, the sort of insistence on repetition. All of those things is what I was like, okay, that's going to be my framework for building an installation that's going to talk about mystery and search and placeness, you know, this idea of a place. And the place was really the randomness and the uncontrollable element of the sidewalk space. Right. And so the the camouflaging of the, the bottles and that I used in still lives with step ladders, I use this it's actually talking about textiles. It's a barrier cloth that I covered the different elements with and, and sort of burned a little bit of reveal of what's underneath with the with the bottles and the luminosity of the bottles. So this is kind of playing with this kind of dark and light dialogue the way Mirandi would, and then repetition and the similar objects being brought into that conversation. And so it, that was what ultimately was all about conjuring mystery and endless possibilities for the viewer within that moment. The other aspect that I really wanted to explore was your use of fang sculptures, because you use them as kind of found objects. They occupy a space, particularly in your grandfather clock sculptures. Tell me about the way that you've used them. What's their role, if you like, in the works? You know, another important artist that I wouldn't want to dismiss is Duchamp, right? And so Duchamp, one of his biggest innovations for the art world is this idea that context matters and the shift really matters. And at the same time, I think he kind of led the way for somebody like Boyce. So people think that a lot of Boyce's works were made for the vitrine, but they weren't. They were performance pieces. They were objects made for performance, and they would end up being placed in the vitrine by maybe himself, but the collectors for sure, his gallery. And so this culture of presenting works in vitrine is actually coming from the anthropological museum or something. It wasn't part of the contemporary art discourse or the, the regular gallery discourse. That was a big shift. And then, you know, somebody like Damien Hirst using vitrine. So the culture of vitrine as a display became almost, uh, for the contemporary art world, almost became a cliche. And so I wanted to figure out how to use a vitrine that wasn't a cliche, right? And so the grandfather clocks became my version of a vitrine, but it wasn't just a vitrine. It was these African bodies hiding under this cosmogram. Because what I did is I, I replaced the face of the clock with that Congolese cosmogram, right? And it's, again, the cycle of life. And, and so for me, it was, it was kind of re-inscribing the story that I was told about these black bodies hiding under the church floor. And so I, I put the African objects, the bodies, inside this vitrine, which isn't a vitrine, it's a clock that's an element of time. And they're sort of in the shadows. They're just kind of hiding in there. So it's the vitrine, but it's really situational to the story that I wanted to tell and bring in the vitrine uh, away from the normal expectation of display only to being about hiding and about escape. The great surprise, talking about language, the wonderful poetic surprise for me is that when I started this project with remaking the, the grandfather clocks, I started looking at what 
you know, clocks to get from eBay because <laughs> I had to get them from eBay. Actually, no, the first one my wife actually found for me. I got to give her props, right? Because this is the first thing she had ever picked up for me, right? She saw on the street this grandfather clock that was being thrown away, this old wooden grandfather clock. And she thought it was really cool. And so she said, oh, he, Nary would love this. And she threw it on the top of the car and, and dragged it home. And, and I kind of got to admit, when I saw it, I was, I was really happy that she did it, but it wasn't talking to me. Like, I, I was like, great. Yeah, thank you. you know, <laughs> but, but usually I'm the one that chooses the thing, right? They talk to me and I'm inspired to do something. So I, I wasn't really inspired yet. So I had this clock that I didn't want to get rid of because he did this amazing thing for me. And I must have had it for about five years just in my basement. So when I when this idea of remaking the vitrine to become this narrative of escape came into me saying, yeah, the clock would be a perfect place for the black bodies to exist. So I did this little research. I was sort of looking up because I wanted to figure out what to do with that pendulum that was in the middle. And I found out that the name of the pendulum, the actual name of the pendulum system is called an anchoring escapement. And that just was like, boom, you know, this whole idea, you know, this thing of anchoring, but also escape, or both of these things resonated within the narrative that I was trying to tell. And so it became uh, a series of works that I, I did with Grandfather Clocks. I was wondering about that title and now it all explains everything. How extraordinary. Again, you, you talked about that role of chance and th there you go. That's how chance can be so productive, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about contemporary artists. Which contemporary artists do you most admire? Oh, man, that's hard on because there's a lot of them. Um, so for different reasons, I would probably and I, that contemporary is relative. Right. So I, I, I kind of feel like one of the artists I look to for his resilience is uh, Isamu Noguchi. Because Noguchi was this artist who, you know, he came up in a very problematic time for Asians, right? I mean, it was always problematic for artists of color, but I think he was even in, in the internment camp, you know, at some indeed, point, yeah. his family, yeah. And I think he left America for a while, and I think he might have even gone to study at Brancusi or an assistant at Brancusi. I just like that he never let any of that hold him down. Whether, you know, so I can't show in a gallery, I'm going to work with the theater, if I can't work in a theater, I'm going to make objects. I'm going to make lights. You know, oh, I can't show in a museum. I'm going to have my own museum. So he was just this super resilient and empowered artist that I kind of look to as, you know, this is the way to do it. There's no limits. You make it work for yourself. Absolutely. It was, it was a kind of social practice his, wasn't it? I mean, it's sort yeah. of, you know, he probably didn't define it in those terms, but he's constantly thinking about audiences and engagement and, and how to position the sculptures for an audience or for broad audiences, I guess. Exactly. But also the marketplace, like he would make, you know, there's still been made his lamps and different kind of things, different products. But that was even that he was ahead of the curve and just like saying, whatever makes sense for the ideas is where I'm going to be. Uh, was there anybody else, any other contemporary artists you wanted to mention? I kind of feel like one of the artists that I, I always think doesn't get enough props is Wilfredo Lamb. He is a Cuban artist, went to Europe, took on all of the pedagogies and influences, but then came back to Cuba and really sort of look at the indigenous culture and wanted to have a dialogue with them rather than just really wanted to, to connect to that place. And I think he did that so brilliantly. For me, he's an important kind of modernist artist. I'd agree. He's a great artist. What do you have pinned to your studio wall? There is one strange thing that's in my bathroom. <laughs> that's actually the, the Obama Yes We Can. I think it was Shepard Farley who did yeah, a yeah. poster. And he's over the, the toilet. But I didn't do it as a sign of disrespect. It was really, it had gotten damaged. And I was like, you know, I don't want to throw this away. It's, it's <laughs> you know, it's, it's Barack Obama. But I really liked that image of him. So I, I always see Barack Obama with an Afro pick when I go to the restroom. So that's kind of cool <laughs> to have. That's great. I wanted to ask you about this point that you said in another interview that you had a Martin Luther King plaque on the, your studio door. And this struck me as being quite a sort of interesting thing that you had this image of MLK as you sort of walked into the studio. It was like a kind of the first thing that you saw. Tell me about that. Yeah, so I live right across the street from the Malia Jackson School, PS123. These kids, they throw away a lot of stuff, or the school throws a lot of stuff. And so there's always, on a monthly basis, 
piles of things they're getting rid of, you know. And I remember going by and seeing this uh, little plaque of Martin Luther King. Just seeing it on top of this trash, I, I said, I can't just walk away from this. I, so I picked it up and it lived on my door for at least two or three years. And then it became part of a work that I did at a new museum that kind of honored uh, Dr. King. And there's a kind of social justice initiative to this King mission, it was called, the King mission. The Martin Luther King plaque was actually, the one that the, the school was throwing out was actually a mold that you could pour plaster or whatever in, you know, you could kind of create more of the same. And so I did hundreds of these little plaques and then I, I sort of made them for this one installation which had a, a kind of a Mahalia Jackson iteration or soundtrack. So apparently Mahalia Jackson sung at Dr. King's funeral. They were good friends and they, they were both very proactive in the civil rights era. And I think there was a song, Precious Lord Take My Hand, I think is the name of the song, that she sung at his funeral. It stayed with me that the name of the school was called Mahalia Jackson School, that I found this King plaque and that I wanted to do something with it that would somehow be effective for a present moment. And so I made these editions where you could buy one of these plaques that I created specifically, framed them up and created for the work. So you, you purchase the piece and you actually donate funds to the Bowery mission because the new museum was right on the Bowery. And then by donating the funds to the Bowery mission, you could get the work. That was kind of the, the way you could get the work. So you could get a tax write-off and do good and get an artwork at the same time. So, so that was King Mission, you know, sort of trying to figure out how to bridge all these different opportunities and create a, a visual experience that would be generous for the viewer. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the app for arts and culture. The free app offers access to more than 70 cultural organisations through a single download, ranging from Turner Contemporary in the UK to the Louis Armstrong House Museum and the Phillips Collection in the US. In 2013, Nari Ward was a Rome Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Rome, the first cultural partner in Italy to join Bloomberg Connects. If you download the app, you can find an interactive guide to the Academy, learn about its history, explore its exhibitions with individual works in depth, and meet the organisation's international community of scholars and artists, including residents like Guillermo Cuica and current Rome Prize Fellows. To explore guides to all the partnering institutions, download Bloomberg Connects today. The free app is available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? It would definitely have to be Studio Museum, but they've been closed for a while. It's still the Studio Museum for all the good reasons for that, you know, that I was an artist in residence there, that it's in Harlem that I'm always intrigued at what they're putting together. But my near second is the new museum. Even before they showed my work, um, I just felt like the new museum is really a kind of a nimble institution that does a lot, even when they were on Broadway. I remember when they were on Broadway. That was a space where I would discover a lot of artists. There are major artists now that I got a chance to see their works. And I always thought because they don't have a collection, their focus has always been on presenting art and prioritizing the artist's vision. So they don't have to think about, you know, what are we going to do with this thing? It's good and bad because then they, they never get to benefit from the the, the, the valuation, the reevaluation of the artist. But they, they definitely do stick with the artists that are living. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? A couple of years ago, I was chosen as a, a fellow for the American Academy in Rome. So we lived in Rome for a year. And that was incredible. I mean, just phenomenal. I feel like that was such a, a revelation of just being outside of a cultural mainstay and being in another kind of space. I feel like there was a lot of growing on my part that happened. And I saw it in my kids as well. So I think that was an important opportunity. Were there any particular art experiences that were part of that extraordinary shift? Or was it just about the space of Rome as well? Because obviously it's such a historic city. It has so much uh, sedimentary power just from all that layering and layering and layering, you know. Yeah, I think it was just that. It was just the sedimentary power of the place. It's a conflation of the everyday and the, the monumental historic 
moment, right? Like you, you walk around a corner, you're having a gelato or something, and then there is this a building that you've only seen in books for all the, your life prior to this, right? You're, and you're like right there in front of it, you know? So the moments are just endless, just kind of constantly uh, having that experience. So I did say my research was in part to look at the Arta Povera artists and look at that movement. So I was looking at a lot of those works in sight, you know, different institutions and different museums. So that was really great to, to sort of see the works that I, again, that I've seen in catalogues in the real world. Let's talk about literature. Which writers or poets do you return to the most? Definitely it's within this last couple of years, James Baldwin, for sure. And then Zora Neale Hurston is another one, Malcolm X. And then a friend of mine hit me to another really intriguing thinker with this guy named Bayou Akomolafe. So my friend Shalin Rodriguez sort of said, you should listen to some of Bayou's talks. He does a lot of lectures. And it was really great to, to hear him. It's kind of a theorist, you know, a philosopher, theorist, really positive energy. I guess. So I, I, that was a really great revelation for me recently. And of course, in the current show, you made a work which is directly in reference to Claude McKay, who's this, you know, another Jamaican-American sort of linchpin of the Harlem Renaissance. What drew you to him? I've always known of Claude McKay's poems. My criticism of poems of anybody in that era is how relevant is it to the now, right? And I felt like this poem is really important poem. It was If We Must Die. And this is a poem that I think he wrote in the I want to say 1919 or something like this. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And it was pre-Marcus Garvey and Black Power Movement. And, you know, it was at the time where lynching was like an American pastime. And so he was really talking about resistance, resisting even if under extreme circumstances, even if you have to die. And I, and I thought that was such an, a necessary mind space to sort of pull back into the contemporary conversation. So that piece is actually, it's a shoelace work. And it's actually in conversation with several other shoelace works. And that was my interest. It's like, uh, there are four shoelace works. There's one called A Proclamation, I'll Take You There, which is the Marvin Gaye song. <laughs> yeah, I'll Take You There. And so I was really interested in how they would dialogue with each other, or how these different moments and different expectations from these texts would cross-communicate, because they're all in the same room and sort of like one installation. And so that's kind of an, an interesting experiment that I'm excited to see reveal itself in the space. You talked about music there. And the next question is about music. What music do you listen to while you're working? Reggae, for sure. You know, <laughs> Jamaica, I have to say that. But I'm, I'm pretty much, you know, I can gladly say that I, there's not a lot of music that I don't like. But definitely reggae, rap, jazz, classical in, in different times. Sometimes, though, I try to go towards instrumental. Like if I'm not sure what I'm doing in my work, <laughs> so this is how it works, but if I'm not sure where the journey is going in the work, I don't want any lyrics. I want the music, I want the drive, but I don't want lyrics. And so jazz, most jazz or, or classical will, will do. But if I know where I'm going and it's just a matter of staying with it and keeping the rhythm, then it's definitely reggae or rap. That's interesting. I love that, that there's different modes of working that come with different forms of music, definitely. Yeah, if you're lost, you don't want to hear, you know, somebody yelling at you about how much money they have or <laughs> you're trying to figure <laughs> shit out yourself. <laughs> 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 um, you mentioned reggae, and uh, you know, obviously there is a work by you called Exodus, and that can't not be a Bob Marley reference, right? It wasn't initially. Exodus was really about movement, but movement on a kind of mass level. Hmm. It was really that impetus, and then the convenience of Bob's song really kind of made sense, and maybe even personalized it in that respect. And that piece was really prioritizing this notion of these discards, these things that have been abandoned and found objects, not being relegated to that space of neglect, but that they were going to be brought somewhere. There's a kind of possibility and hope that could be aligned with their travel, with their journey. And you mentioned Mahalia Jackson earlier, and of course she is the voice in Amazing Grace, your piece, kind of your first signature piece, I guess. Yeah. And is it right that that's also sort of a family reference? Your father used to listen to her singing Amazing Grace. Yeah, he had this A-track player that he subscribed to this club that you could get this every month or two. You get a new A-track. And so it come in the mail. And so you had a whole series of 
of Mahalia Jackson, the tracks. And so he would always play Amazing Grace on a Sunday for sure, but almost every day. But as a child, it was kind of punishment. Like, you could, oh, here he goes again, you know. But as I grew older, it became more of a connection to to him, but also to early memories and, and more positive, you know, more of a kind of positive references and echoes. That's almost like the last part of Amazing Grace, the Baby Stroller piece. The sound was the last part because I did it entirely myself. I didn't have any assistance at the time. I couldn't afford assistance. So I would spend, I think it was at least a week, maybe 10 days trying to figure out what that configuration would be and what it meant and find the space to present it in a, an old firehouse. But what happens, I felt like the piece got started with getting very dark and I, I needed to give this moment of hope and this moment of light and levity to it. And I think that so it made me start to think about Mahalia Jackson and that song that I heard my father would play. And so that made sense because that was about the time that I found out that the school across the street was called Mahalia Jackson. So it all kind of came together. I wanted to ask you about I'll Take You There, because as you say, there's this sort of one of the things about having evocative words like that and like If We Must Die is that obviously a certain element of the audience is going to see those words and they will start singing that very song or start thinking about that poem in their head. But other people won't necessarily get the reference. So one of the interesting things, I guess, is that you're finding a sort of way of addressing the audience that doesn't presuppose any knowledge, but can trigger all manner of different forms of knowledge, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to decry Wikipedia. Like, I think part of it is also that this new generation might say, hey, let me see what this. And then they could get a whole set of other information about this era, about this song. For me, it was really intriguing because, you know, I'll Take You There was a song that I remembered more as a kind of pop song. It was kind of a popular, it crossed over into the mainstream. It was a number one hit, right? It was a, I think it yeah, was number one. Yeah, the yeah. staple singers. And I didn't realize that it also was a protest song, right? It had a protest component to it. And it was also kind of uplift. You know, it was really like, there's possibilities here. And I thought, you know, don't worry about the smiling faces that are lying to the races. All that stuff is really, and I felt like that line alone, smiling faces lying to the races, I feel like it brought us back to a kind of contemporary distrust of media, right? And and so all of those different stratas of the, the expectation for that song sort of became intriguing to mine within the, the exhibition. And one question about the shoelace works. I hadn't realized that you actually construct the shoelaces. I thought they were all found shoelaces, but you actually... So, <laughs> so you actually take pieces of material and you do the actual making them right. into shoelaces, right? So early on, I, I'd cut up like one shoelace can get different lengths, right? Then... And then I, I kind of started to think, well, you know, I need to make the aglets. Those little plastic or metal things are called aglets, right? And that's actually what makes them a shoelace, right? Otherwise, it's just a string. <laughs> it's just a, a string. So I decided that, you know, I had to find my own way of making the aglets and making uh, this kind of shoelace. So they're shoelaces and they're, they're sort of broken down and then they're remade into shoelaces again. They're fictionalized shoelaces. It's all about artifice, you know. I'm not a douche champion. I, I gotta make it. <laughs> what other media influence your work? So definitely, as you mentioned, textiles. Social media is also something that I don't fight against. Like I'm very critical of it, but I, I understand its power and I'm trying to figure out how to use that and find the spaces or create spaces for other kind of things to happen. I mean, the thing about social media that I we all know is it's seductive nature. It's like a drug. The algorithms that are used to, to create it, they know this. These little clicks, there's something gratifying about each moment that you can get from them. And so I, I kind of feel like that's one of my biggest competition. What I mean by that is the same way that social media is pervasive, I've got to figure out in my practice how to make materiality as present. That's our artist. That's our vehicle, at least the artists that I'm looking at. And how to make that materiality as, as complicated and as present and as mysterious as possible. Uh, is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? 
walking, man, walking, Ben. You know, we talk about clicks, the clicks to get stuff and buy things on eBay. But for me, it's also the chance of finding things and looking at things and the conflation of things. And the benefit of being in an urban space is that there are more moments of conflation that can happen in the time span. On a regular, that's one of the most sort of gratifying exercise <laughs> routine. That just to, and, and what I mean by that is it's not like I'm going to the store. I, I don't really have a point of destination. I'll just say, you know, I just want to figure out where this street is going to take me. Or I remember this thing I saw. Let me go see what what's going on now with it. Like today I went looking for memorials because I need more candles. So, you know, I have to go out and find the memorials so that I can replace the candles. So I can take the candles back to the studio and do. That's actually really exciting when I'm finding things or I'm hunting for things that I need. So it's the hunting and the discovering that happens in that. There's a whole seam of walking artists. I mean, of course, there's the obvious walking artists, people like Richard Long and Hamish Fulton, who's literally the walk is the work, you know. Right. But also the sort of urban artist who is using the walk as a kind of both a thinking space and a kind of material laboratory, it seems to me, is like a kind of really fertile seam in the whole of recent art, right? Yeah, and a walk is important because I remember even before COVID, I had gotten a little electric scooter i actually bought it so that my daughter and i could go scootering you know this is before scooters even were a big thing before they even started having them so you can rent them so that was our time together my daughter and i but i couldn't be in the time space on a scooter like i had to be walking like it just literally today she was like when are we gonna go scootering again i was like you know i i need to walk i need I, one i need to exercise <laughs> but also it it puts me in touch with the landscape in a much more basic way if you could live with one work of art what would it be it would have to be de maria's earth room walter de maria's earth room i remember this piece it's one of the early works I had a, at the School of Visual Arts, it wasn't in a contemporary art school or um, fine art school, so when I was going as an illustrator, I had this really great teacher named Juan Gonzalez. He had a class, make sure that we would go to galleries almost on a daily basis. And, and he sent me to the Maria's Broken Kilometer and the Earth Room. And that just blew me away. Those two spaces just blew me away. I remember thinking, this earth room is really special. Even up to today, that's like one of the biggest thing I sent in my classes there to, to just to go, just to see it. Even more relevant because it's New York City and real estate is now king. Just to see a room that's filled with earth and smell the earth in the space is just powerful. Indeed it is. And lastly, what's art for? I kind of feel like there's no one thing. What I would want it to be for is to be for healing. But I also feel like it's necessary for reimagining life, right? You know, we were always talking about art as being a kind of sidecar <laughs> journey, but it also can affect where the bike goes. That's the one thing. It's, it's not an impotent sidecar. It affects where the, the steering is. So I, I feel like that dialogue of mystery that it conjures is also about where hope comes from. So it's all interconnected. Mary, thank you so much. Yeah, Ben, it was a pleasure. Yeah, I enjoyed this. Nary Ward, I'll Take You There, a proclamation is at Lehman Maupin from the 28th of April to the 4th of June. And that's it for this episode, and indeed this series. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening, and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows, and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing, and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack, and the producers of the Art Newspaper Podcasts are Julia Mihalska, Amy Dawson, and Henrietta Bentel. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway. A huge thank you to Nari Ward. We'll be back with more episodes in June. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.